Today on the John Ackerberg Show, many Christians expect Jesus to return in their lifetime. Why? Because Jesus promised, I will come again and receive you unto myself. At the rapture, the Apostle Paul writes, Christians will be caught up from the earth or raptured to meet Christ in the air and to travel with him to his Father's house in heaven. But at Christ's second coming, different events happen. The Bible says Jesus will come all the way down to planet Earth where his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. He will rescue believers and usher them into his millennial kingdom on Earth. What are the eight differences the Bible teaches will occur at the rapture that will not happen at the second coming? And what are the eight different things that will happen at the second coming that will not occur at the rapture? My guests today are Dr. Renal Showers, widely recognized as one of the most distinguished theologians in America and author of numerous books. My second guest is international journalist and prophecy scholar, Dr. Jimmy DeYoung, who has lived and worked in the Middle East for over 20 years. He will report on how events in our world today are rapidly leading toward the events the ancient Jewish prophets predicted will come about in the last days. We invite you to join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that the rapture and the second coming are all just one event that happened at the same time? Or are they separate events that have different things that happen separated by a period of seven years? Well, that's what we're going to discuss today. My guests are Dr. Renal Showers and Dr. Jimmy DeYoung. And uh, last week we started this and we saw that there's a difference, according to the Bible, between the rapture and the second coming in the place that Christ will meet believers. At the rapture, Christians will meet the Lord in the air. But at the second coming, Christ descends all the way to the earth and steps onto the Mount of Olives and rescues believers that stay on earth and go into the millennial kingdom. Second, there's a difference in who removes people from the earth. Very interesting verses we looked at last week that showed at the rapture, it says the Lord Himself will descend and He's going to come and He's going to take the Christians out. But according to the Bible, at the second coming, Christ sends His angels to take the wicked away to judgment, to hell. And the third one was, there's a difference in those who are taken from the earth and those who are left. Again, if you missed it, that was just a fascinating program. The ones who are taken at the rapture are the believers, and who's left? The unbelievers on earth. At the second coming, the believers stay on earth and the angels are sent to take away the wicked. So you have those three differences. Today we're going to talk about a couple more. And one of those is there is also a difference, Dr. Showers, of when Jesus comes in relationship to the seven-year period of tribulation. Okay? At the rapture, Jesus comes to rescue Christians before the hour of trial, the tribulation, or the wrath to come. Now, let me give you the verses on this side before we give them on the other. Now I'm going to ask you to comment. Here's a verse. Revelation 3.10 says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, talking to the Christians, I also will keep thee from the hour of trial, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Let me throw in one more verse with that. 1 Thessalonians 1.10. He's talking to the Thessalonian Christians. He says, You are waiting for His Son, God's Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, let's just take those two verses. Then I'm going to talk about the second coming. Well, exactly what, it, what it's saying there. That it's, they're going to be delivered you know, before uh, the tribulation period breaks out upon planet Earth. Yeah, but take apart those words. I will keep thee from the hour, hour of trial, temptation. Trial or testing, yes. And that's what he's saying, that I, I will deliver you before that hour of testing comes. You don't have to go through that hour of testing at all. And then in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 
It's, it's a, a Greek present tense there that the Thessalonian Christians every day had the idea of waiting up, is what it really says there in the Greek, waiting up uh, for Jesus to come from heaven. And the implication is that apparently the Apostle Paul, when he had, had taught them about this, emphasized that the future coming of Christ to rapture the church is an imminent event, which means it can happen at any moment. It's always hanging over your head and, it, and there's nothing else that has to happen before uh, that will take place. And therefore, you should be ready at any moment for the Lord Jesus to come and take you uh, from the earth. Okay, so those are all the events that transpire underneath what happens at the rapture. Right. Now, at the second coming, when we look at those verses, Matthew 24, 29 and 30 says, immediately after the tribulation. Right. That's what the Bible says. After the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, why is that not the rapture? Well, uh, for, for one thing, it, Jesus is saying this is what's going to happen after the end of the Great Tribulation. And uh, therefore, it wouldn't be the rapture of the church. He's not talking about people being caught up from the earth to meet him in the air. He's talking about he's going to be coming out of heaven in his glorious second coming down to planet earth. And uh, the great cosmic disturbances taking place before that. And according to the imminency of Christ's return for the church, has nothing to say about cosmic disturbances. In fact, it, those references to cosmic disturbances tie in with the same cosmic uh, disturbances that took place in Old Testament times. And every time those appeared, it was a forewarning that this is now the day of the Lord's wrath judgment going to come upon planet Earth. And so when Jesus here is talking about this and after the Great Tribulation, these cosmic disturbances that have happened many times in the past before God's wrath came out, this is a forewarning to the world. And that's why when they see Christ coming out of heaven and everything with regard to that, people on the earth are going to go into deep mourning. They're going to be frightened, like everything. In fact, the, the powers of the heavens, they're going to be shaken by this. And, and Greek scholars point out that's referring to the evil, demonic, angelic beings who have followed Satan in his revolt against God. That when they see those cosmic disturbances, they know the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon them as well as upon planet Earth uh, here. Be, as Jesus is coming back to restore God's theocratic kingdom rule to planet Earth. Yeah. Explain what imminency actually means for people that don't understand. The word imminent literally means hanging overhead. And so when an event is imminent, it's always hanging over your head every moment of every day. And therefore, it can fall upon you at any time. You can't, you can't count on any period of time between now and that particular event to take place. What does that do in terms of if it is imminent, then all of these things that are going to happen in the tribulation, those are all signs that have to happen according to Matthew 24 before Jesus comes back at the second coming. Right. And so you still got two separate events going on here. Yes, biblically there are no signs before he comes out to rapture the church. But as we're pointing out here, Jesus made it very clear, after the great tribulation, there are going to be these great cosmic disturbance signs uh, warning the people and, and even shaking up the demonic angels because they were around to see the previous cosmic disturbances which always were attacking uh, by God upon people upon planet Earth. But when these appear, what's going to shake them up is they're going to imply to them these are the ones that are going to impact us. And that's why the evil demonic angels and everything under Satan's control shake at that particular, at that particular time. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come on back, we're going to switch 
hats here, and we're talking about the rapture, and then what happens after the rapture? And in this time after the rapture, the Bible doesn't leave us in the dark. It gives some clear explanation. It's pretty scary information when you apply it to what the world, what we see in our world today. And I'm going to ask Dr. Jimmy DeYoung to take us to this whole teaching that the Bible talks about the revival of the old Roman Empire. I mean, we all know what the old Roman Empire was. What's the revival? When's that going to take place? Who's going to be involved? Who's going to lead it? How much power are they going to have? Etc. Etc. So, folks, we'll ask them to answer those questions. When we come right back. Stick with us. If you would like to have all of the information in today's series entitled One Coming or Two, The Eight Differences Between the Rapture and the Second Coming, the five television programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of $49 and come as both a Blu-ray and DVD combo set. And you may order these programs now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. All right, we're back. We're talking with Dr. Renal Showers and Dr. Jimmy DeYoung. And Jimmy, I want to come to you. When we look at the world, the world is in turmoil just about any nation that you look at right now. And a lot of people are worried about that. And the Bible has something to say about what is going to happen across the world after this supernatural event of Christ coming back, snatching, rapturing, catching off the face of the earth, all the Christians at that moment, they're gone. Only unbelievers are left at that point. They do stuff. Things happen. Take us to this whole teaching that the Bible talks about the revival of the old Roman Empire. What do those terms mean? Well, I want to start back with Jesus teaching the Olivet Discourse, the most profound prophetic message that there was ever given in the world and the master teacher, Jesus Christ. At the conclusion, he said something very interesting. Luke chapter 21, that record of the Olivet Discourse, and in verse 24, he was talking about Jerusalem and he said, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now that last phrase is a key phrase in all of Bible prophecy, the times of the Gentiles. It starts in 605 B.C. when Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, and his three buddies are taken into the Babylonian captivity. Then it extends all the way through until Jesus Christ comes back and He's that stone that hits those ten toes and the image of the man and burst it into pieces as found there in the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had which Daniel interpreted. You might remember the dream. A head of gold was on this man, this image of the man, and that would be the Babylonian Empire, chest and arms of silver, the Medo-Persian Empire, belly and thighs of brass, the Grecian Empire, the legs, two of them, of iron, that would be the Roman Empire. And then it had ten toes, ten toes of iron and clay. And a stone comes along, hits those ten toes, bursts them into pieces, they fly away, and that stone becomes a mighty mountain. Of course, the stone is Jesus Christ. That mighty mountain is the kingdom. Now, about Fifty years later, after Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he had a dream himself in chapter 7. And he talked about these same Gentile world powers. He used different characters, but it ends up with, in verse 7, talking about the Roman Empire in essence, and we know retrospectfully, looking back through history, that indeed that fourth Gentile world power is the Roman Empire. And as we notice what he says, it had ten horns. They compare to those ten toes in chapter 2. It's talking about as defined by Daniel himself in verses 23 and 24 of Daniel chapter 7, a revival of a Gentile world power. Now remember the Roman Empire did not control the entire world. 
It controlled the Mediterranean region at the time of Jesus Christ. In the future, and that's what the text tells us there in chapter 7, verses 23 and 24, it will control the world. And so we're going to have to have a revival of that old Roman Empire to come into place and take control of the whole world. Uh, there are a number of other verses in prophetic passages that help us to come to that understanding. Uh, but it talks about out of those ten horns comes a little horn. Now we're starting to see the Antichrist is going to come out of the revived Roman Empire. Well, what is the revived Roman Empire? I believe at least the infrastructure is the European Union of today. And what I'm talking about, when you look back to March the 25th, 1957, in the city of Rome, Italy, on Capitol Line Hill, six of the European leaders stood together and they signed the Treaty of Rome, which actually brought about the economic community for all of Europe. Uh, the common market it was referred to as well. And that has evolved into what we have today as the European Union. The European Union leaders, and there were 27 member states at the time they did this, they signed the Lisbon Treaty. The Lisbon Treaty was signed November the 3rd, 2009. And then on a visit soon after that signing, Hillary Clinton was meeting with Catherine Ashton, who is now the Chief of Foreign Policy for the European Union. And in Brussels, Hillary Clinton said, this is the most historic event that I've ever seen happen in my lifetime. I believe in what she was talking about. There was at least a foundation upon which the European Union can become that superpower. There are now 28 member states. How do you get to the 10? Well, if you look at the Lisbon Treaty, it does have a committee for regions, and they want to move ahead and put all of the European countries into 10 different regions, by the way, according to the treaty. Now, that may well be the, the fulfillment of what is found there in Daniel 7, or there may be another way. All I'm simply saying is there is the infrastructure, the foundation for this revived Roman Empire. They're ready. They want to come to power. 28 member states, that's what makes up the council. And then you have the uh, European Parliament, you have the European Commission. These are three different entities trying to lead this European continent with their states coming together. But the other day, foreign ministers met in Brussels and they said, hey, wait a minute, what we need is to eliminate all three of these, come with one leadership, and make the leadership of that entity a supra president. Now, when you go back to the Word of God, here you see chapter 7, book of Daniel, ten horns. I would suggest that's the revived Roman Empire. And out of that ten horns comes a little horn. That's the Antichrist. And then what does he do? He goes over and confirms a peace treaty, Daniel 9, 27, with Israel and all of her neighbors. Folks, we're living in a time when all of this is playing out right in front of us. And if we'll watch from the sidelines, we can see how Bible prophecy is about to be fulfilled. It's amazing to me as we watch this European Union coming to power. They have a common currency. They want to have a common language. They're getting ready to have their own their military operation. Those were the aspects of the old Roman Empire. We have to have a revival. You don't revive something that's dead. You revive something that's alive. It's alive. This political operation is in place. We see everything happening. And let me just remind you of something. Before that seven-year period of time is in operation, in other words, the clock starts ticking on it, you have to have three things as I understand the Scriptures. You have to have the revival of that Roman Empire, you have to have the appearance of the Antichrist, and you have to have that confirmation of the peace treaty which starts the clock ticking on the seven years. So you have the rapture, we don't know how long between the rapture and the beginning of the seven year period of time. There has to be a period. And then the Antichrist confirms that peace treaty. We're off and running in the tribulation period. What does that mean? Hey, the revived Roman Empire is key to the scenario that the Lord laid out. And Jerusalem will be under the control of these Gentile world powers until he comes back. That's the activities in that seven years. Rennie, we've got a minute left here. We can see some of the things that the Bible is saying 
our possibilities in our own day, okay? As Jimmy says, you got the infrastructure for a great European power, 28 member states right now. That's a lot of people. It's a lot of money. That's a lot of power. Uh, one of the interviews that we missed in the Middle East was Tony Blair. We were, we were playing tag with him back and forth, but he was the envoy for the European Union going and trying to negotiate with Israel and trying to, to influence what would happen in Israel. And, you know, you see where these people have a lot of power, okay? Mm -hmm. Folks in Europe are watching right now. They feel that power. How does this relate to people understanding what the Bible is saying, how important it is, and where events are headed? How close are we to some of these events? Well, you cannot help but feel that way at everything. Uh, you know, it does look like that's the direction that the powers of the world are headed right now. And uh, since we believe the Bible teaches very clearly that the church is going to be gone before you know, that fully takes control of the whole world system and everything. It does, again, uh, kind of emphasize imminency. You know, you better be ready any moment of any day. You know, it could be that we're going to be snatched up from the earth to be Christ of the air at, at any moment. Yeah. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you have not put your trust in what He did for you on the cross, I'd advise you to do it because that's the only place where there's safety. There's the place where he's the one that's going to come that's going to be the ruler. He's the one that's the judge. You don't want to meet him as judge. You want to meet him as Savior and Lord. And, and if you haven't prayed and asked Christ to come into your life to forgive you, then why not do it right now? Next week, I hope that you'll join us because we're going to turn to the very interesting topic of the Battle of Armageddon. What does the Bible say about the Battle of Armageddon? And we're also going to continue to look at the differences between the rapture and the second coming. Very, very interesting things that we've got to present to you, and I hope you'll join us then. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's program. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, One Coming or Two, the eight differences between the rapture and the second coming. Why the rapture and the second coming are not the same event, but two different events separated by the seven year tribulation period. Why the rapture is an imminent event in which Jesus could come back at any moment, while the second coming is not an imminent event, but must be preceded by the seven years of tribulation on the earth. You will also learn eight different things that the Bible teaches will happen at the rapture that will not happen at the second coming, and eight different things that will occur at the second coming that will not occur at the rapture. In addition, after the rapture, what does the Bible say about the Antichrist, a powerful new political leader who will arise and persuade the world to follow his ideas? What will he do? And at the Battle of Armageddon, what will happen? And which nations will be involved? And when Jesus returns to the earth at the second coming, what will happen? And what will he do? The five television programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of $49 and come as both a Blu-ray and DVD combo set. Then, we are making available a second series called Step by Step Through the Rapture with Dr. Renal Showers and Dr. Jimmy DeYoung. All four television programs in this series are available for a gift of $49. In this series, you will learn where the Bible teaches that a whole generation of believers around the world will be taken in mass into God's presence at the time of the rapture and that they will never know what it is to die physically. How Jesus made a comparison between Jewish marriage customs in his own day and his coming to receive his bride, the church, at the rapture in John chapter 14. And what the Bible teaches will happen after the rapture and why events in the world today are rapidly leading us toward the alliance of nations. The ancient prophet Ezekiel predicted 
will come against Israel in the last days. The four television programs in Step by Step Through the Rapture are available on DVD for a gift of $49 and come as both a Blu-ray and DVD combo set. Then third, we are making available two new study guides with extensive notes that parallel our two television series. Each study guide is available for a gift of $8 or for five or more copies for $5 each. And finally, if you would like to have all of these items together, that is both TV series containing nine television programs plus the two study guides, all four of these items are available together in a special package for only $99. And you may order this special package now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. Or you may also order these materials at our website at jashow.org. Now folks, during this series, we're also making available our Ultimate Prophecy Package, which features 17 prophecy scholars over 40 television programs, six study guides, and about 24 hours of content. And my guests on these television series include Prime Minister of Israel Benjamin Netanyahu, retired three-star general William G. Boykin, Dr. David Jeremiah, Zola Levitt, Dr. Tim LaHaye, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, Dr. Jimmy DeYoung, Dr. David Breeze, Dr. John Walverd, and many others. All 40 television programs in the Ultimate Prophecy Package are available now for a gift of only $100. And you may order it by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. Now as we close today, here are some scenes from next week's program. I think this may well be one of the most outstanding signs of the fact that uh, we're close to the tribulation period. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, flee, get out of Jerusalem. Now, the abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4, walks into the temple, going into the Holy of Holies, and he claims to be God. That is the abomination of desolation. But there must be something that happens before he can walk into the Holy of Holies. There has to be a temple there. And there is no temple there. But I'm here to tell you, and I've searched this through, and they're ready to build that temple. <laughs> <laughs>